Hello again. My name is Ted Meyerson. I'm a volunteer with AARP Maryland. Today is another Fraud Watch Friday. We've done several of these so far. We started with third party energy suppliers all the way down through staying safe from scams. Today, June 4, we're going to talk about child identity theft, what parents and grandparents need to know. And on June 18th, we're going to have a conversation with Lisa Schiaffarelli, Senior Policy Analyst with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Office of Older Americans. Now, you can see recordings of these presentations on AARP Maryland YouTube page. Just go to YouTube and type in AARP Maryland, and you should come up with all of the recordings of all the previous sessions, including this one, which will be up there by tomorrow. Now, if you find them of interest, you can get your friends and family to uh, look at the presentations there and see whether or not there's information they can use. So let's get started with today's presentation, child identity theft. What is it? Well, it's when somebody, when someone use, uses a child's personal, personal, personally identifiable information to commit fraud. It can be from a very young child all the way up to kids going to college at 18. They're all considered to be children. Well, is it a serious problem? Does it happen? Yes, it happens. According to the Javelin Strategy and Research Company, in 2017, over a million kids had their identity stolen. And that resulted in $2.6 billion in losses with families having out-of-pocket costs of up to $540 million. Now we know things on the internet have gotten bigger and better over time. And I'm sure those numbers are worse now than they were then. So it really is an issue. So why is child identity so attractive to thieves? Well, in today's world, parents apply for a social security card for newborns and the child has no credit history. So without any negatives, people can use that social security number for various purposes and they can use it for years before somebody figures it out. They can get credit cards, loans, leases, all kinds of things. And you may not know about it until your child applies for a driver's license or tries to get a job or financial aid at school or anything where somebody would check their social security number to see whether or not they're a good credit risk. So where do thieves get information? Birth announcements? medical forms, hospital forms, doctor's offices, and you fill out all kinds of forms. Government applications for services, wow. School applications form, forms from nursery school, childcare, and public school. Everybody's looking for information and information is there. School or club rosters have lots of information. School records, have information and social media. Everybody puts so much stuff on social media that if somebody wants to use it for, uh, for evil, they can figure out a way to do it. More people have access to foster children and their information than people who aren't foster children. So they become particularly vulnerable. Uh, theft can be by the custodial or non-custodial parent, close relative, or family or friend. As a matter of fact, a lot of identity theft is done by a close relative or a family friend. Schools have lots of information. Don't put social security number on the school form unless it's legally required. And if the school asks you to do that, asked why they need it and how it will be protected. Schools should never use a social security number as an ID number. 
that's just leaving it out there for, for somebody to pick up. Student directories, we referred to this before, can have lots of information. It can be, you know, people want to have a directory, you want to know how to get all of the next, you know, another kid in their class. And so you have the name, address, date of birth, telephone number, email address, and photo may be available to the people in your child's class, in the school, or even to the general public. Now, the school has information which is protected by law. And you're supposed to get an annual notice from, from the school that explains your rights under the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, it's called FERPA. You have a right to inspect and review your child's education records. And you have a right to approve the disclosure of personal information in your child's records. The way you prevent it, you know, here are some ideas. Keep papers and electronic records with your child's personal information secure. If you got, you know, uh, birth certificates, uh, whatever, keep them in a safe place. If you have a safe deposit box, maybe you want to put them there. And the stuff you don't need to keep, shred it, micro shred all kinds of, any kind of paper with your uh, child's personal information. As a matter of fact, you'd be wise to do it for your personal information as well. If a child's social security number is requested, again, ask why it's necessary and how it will be protected. Be aware of events that might expose information. You know, what happens if your doctor's office is broken in? or notified uh, of a data breach someplace, you're doing business with, uh, you have a mortgage. And when you applied for the mortgage, uh, they wanted to know your children, their names, your date of birth and whatever. And there was a data breach with the, with the company and they notified you. Well, then you wanna be alert. Maybe somebody picked up information about your child. Teach your child to keep personal information private and not to respond to emails. 90% of all hacks happen when somebody clicks on a link. So tell your kids, never click on a link to open whatever they've been tempted to do. If they've been tempted to get a prize or whatever, whatever don't click on the link. And the most important step towards safeguarding a child's identity is vigilance. Just stay alert and know what's going on. Freeze your child's credit. What that means is if your child has a credit report, you're going to tell the credit card company to not give out any information without permission. That's what freezing credit means. Now, each of the, of the major credit bureaus has their own rules and regulations for doing that. So you want to contact TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax and determine what their requirements and procedures are to freeze a child's credit. And if you haven't, you might want to freeze your own credit at the same time. Some warning signs. Now, some of these are going to seem really obvious. You know, your child receives a bill in their own name. That'd be strange. Or gets a credit card or pre-approved pre credit card offer. Or gets a call from a collection agency. That'd be kind of a clue, wouldn't it? Or a government benefit is turned down because a benefit is being already paid to someone. Or has a credit report existing in their name that you have not frozen. IRS sends notice that the child's name and our social security number is being used in a separate tax return. So just be alert. There are other things that aren't listed here. And if it seems strange, check it out. And when your child turns 16, check whether or not the child has a credit report under their social security number. Why? Because if there are issues, you'll have time to fix them. If you have an issue, or maybe if you just want to look at what's there, 
go to identitytheft.gov, identitytheft.gov. The homepage looks like this. On the lower left-hand side, where it says, or browse recovery steps, if you click on that, you'll get a screen that looks like this one. And if you click on special forms of identity theft, you'll see child identity theft is one that's listed. And if you click on it, this is one of several pages about what to do and how to proceed. It's a really good um, web page that's worth looking at. You might just want to check that web page out on your own just to see it's there. And you can call AARP Fraud Watch Network. That's 877-908-3360. You don't have to be a member. They have people there who can help you. And there's a map that will show you what's going on in where you live. Uh, there's tips on how to prevent fraud and scams. And uh, you can sign up for a biweekly newsletter. And again, you don't have to be a member of AARP. So there you have it. And I hope that has given you some information that you will find useful.